Welcome! Now, a few years ago, I made a video on the manga 14, which is still the absolute craziest manga I've ever experienced. So with such a fabulous first impression, as well as me getting a bit more curious on the world of horror manga, I decided to check out more of the manga from 14's creator, Kazuo Emezu. Which led me to the focus of this video, The Drifting Classroom, one of Kazuo Mezu's most popular series. The Drifting Classroom follows Sho Takamatsu, a 6th grader who refuses to grow up. However, under certain circumstances he's forced to, as one day after a mysterious explosion, he and his entire school are transported into a dark wasteland of a world. The adults of the school are simply not mentally prepared for this whole situation, leading many of them going crazy, either killing themselves or each other, with the few that do survive practically turning into monsters. Leading the kids of the school to take action if they want to survive in their cruel new environment, in which Sho has to step up and become their leader. And Sho definitely has his work cut out for him here. The world they found themselves in is barren and have no choice but to survive off what they have on hand as well as whatever they can salvage within the school. Then there's also dealing with the various other kids of different grades, managing their already limited supply of food and water, power struggles amongst the kids for leadership, dealing with the remaining adults, and simply trying to figure out how to make it all just work. And that's just the struggles within the school, as there's still a whole wasteland out there full of many terrors and obstacles show and the school have to overcome, whether it be the unpredictable terrain of the world or the various terrifying creatures that roam it. These kids certainly have it rough, making it super endearing as you see them all try to work together and support each other in the nightmare they now live in. Eventually, the kids sort of make a system in which everyone has their own tasks to do, building weapons and defenses, exploring the world for possible supplies, and just trying to understand their world, as it gets stranger and more dangerous by the chapter. You just want to see these kids succeed, but every breakthrough and accomplishment here is usually quickly met with something or someone bringing danger to the whole school. The manga does a fantastic job in having you feel the fear and loss of these kids as they go through hell where no one is safe and some horrendous twist is around every corner. And the manga is like this from the very beginning. Well, maybe not as traditionally terrifying as what the manga has later in store, but personally speaking, the first chapter impacted me maybe even more so than a lot of the moments later in the manga. In the beginning of the series, we see Sho and his mom getting into a pretty nasty argument, which winds up with Sho angrily running off to school, getting caught in the explosion. And this whole chapter, the setup and aftermath, really hit home. I've mentioned in the past that I'm very close to my family, especially with my mom. And of course, despite our good relationship with each other, we still have arguments every now and then. However, my mom has always wanted whatever we were arguing about to be resolved on good terms pretty quickly after the initial argument, especially if either of us were about to leave the house. My mom's reasoning for this is that life is always unpredictable, and you never really know when it will be the last time you'd be able to speak to someone, and she never wanted either of our last memories of each other, god forbid, be us being mad at each other. And Drifting Classroom's very first chapter was this fear fully realized, and it's heartbreaking. Especially when said argument between Sho and his mom had some misunderstandings and could have been avoided. However, his mom now has to deal with her last memories of her boy being yelling at each other and him storming out of the house, only to be, at least to her knowledge, blown up alongside his school. Sho also deals with this grief, now lost in a monstrous world with no proper adult figure, regretting his last moments with his mom. It's devastating, the slow reveal of what happened to Sho's school, and everyone around the area's reaction to it. It's amazingly impactful and a perfect hook for this manga. Of course, a lot of the thrills and horror this manga is known for come after the school is transported, in dealing with the new world's environment and creatures as well as each other. As this manga is super tense, definitely one of the series that keeps you constantly at the edge of your seat, as these kids desperately struggle for survival. One of the more tense moments of this manga for me personally comes a bit later, where Sho gets sick and requires surgery. However, there are no qualified doctors, so they have no choice but to use the kid 
whose parents were doctors, using only whatever they could find lying around the school. And yes, as you can imagine, it's painful, stressful, and kind of hard to watch at times. And if that situation wasn't tense enough as is, there is also monsters crawling around outside and a group of kids against show prowling around the school in order to find him. Like I said, these kids just don't have it easy. However, amidst all the terror and chaos are quite a few outlandish and funny moments that I'm not entirely sure are intentional. Very much like 14, there's just bizarre moments in the series. Whether it be extreme leaps of logic, 100% committing to the pretty outrageous scenarios, and just like the scene where everyone has to jump across this abyss, which is pretty terrifying at first, as it's a hard jump to make and some of these kids do wind up falling in. However, Sho basically does the Mario 64 Bowser toss on this unconscious girl to get her across, and I honestly laughed my ass off when reading the scene for the first time. But going back to the more crazy leaps of logic here, after a while it seems like Sho is able to communicate with his mom. Somehow. They kind of explained it, but like, only kinda. In certain situations when Sho's in dire need, he could basically call his mom to send him stuff, leading the Sho's mom to go mama bear mode and frantically get the thing she needs leading to some interesting back and forths, with the methods of actually sending said objects being pretty elaborate. Though there is a section of the manga that comes towards the end, where I feel it got a little too over the top, which I'm not going to spoil here, as it's really baffling when you come across it for the first time, but if you've read this manga already, then you'd know exactly what I'm referring to. But in terms of outrageous scenes, the one I see get memed on a lot online, or the chair scenes in which the kids sort of just crouch down and visualize themselves as chairs in order to avoid monsters. Which, yeah, considering how seriously this manga takes a lot of these outlandish moments, it did get a chuckle out of me at times. But with that in mind, as well as thanks to a mini essay attached to the final volume of the manga, The Nightmarish Imagination by Saburo Kawamoto, you start to get an understanding of not just the core of the horror of Drifting Classroom, but also for the entirety of Kazu Umezu's work. To paraphrase the essay I just mentioned, Umezu never let go of his childhood fears. He's just as afraid of the dark now as he was a child, and uses those fears he's kept with him all this time, now infused with his hyper-imagination, to make a lot of his manga. Which just makes it feel a lot more genuine. Umezu isn't exactly going out of his way to try to scare his readers, but rather pull from the fears he's familiar with. And reflecting on this manga, you can see a lot of those genuine childhood fears. Getting separated from your family, getting lost alone in some place unfamiliar, in which everything around you feels alien, which of course this manga takes to the most extreme. The monsters here are giant-sized icky bugs and other creatures that really feel like the ones you'd imagine going bump in the night. Which of course brings us back to the chair scenes. Putting all this into perspective, it doesn't feel so out of place anymore. I'm sure most people have memories as a kid being freaked out from some noise you heard in the middle of the night, and just lie frozen in your bed, maybe hiding under the blanket for a bit out of fear of whatever monster your imagination came up with, waiting for you to make some move. And there's a lot of moments in Drifting Classroom that just kind of invoke those primal childhood fears. Of course, aiding the terror is the art, mainly the facial expressions. As I mentioned in my 14 video, these faces are iconic for a reason. I honestly can't think of another face out there that perfectly captures the feeling of being horrified. Like, you can almost hear the blood-curdling screams here just looking at them with the gaping mouths shading and manic eyes. Drifting Classroom isn't as graphic and gory as other horror manga I've read, but the pain and shock faces here absolutely sell every blow. With the wild eyes and twisted expressions, you could almost feel every stab here. Though again, the tears in Umezu's manga just look really gross. Like, it just looks like snot coming out of their eyes. Overall though, I had a great time with The Drifting Classroom and would highly recommend it to horror fans or anyone out there just looking for a thrilling read. Hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to support both me and the channel, then feel free to check out either my Ko-fi or Patreon page, and where you could get these videos a day early, along with special channel updates. 
It would mean a lot, and thank you so much to my current patrons. Peace out.